Oh, we're live. All right, Lab Agents, thanks for having us again today. This is our first webinar of the week, and it's a fun one. <laughs> let's, see, uh, let's see if you guys can learn something here. We've got some special guests with us and one of our moderators here, Shaniqua Badge. She's a friend of mine. She's from up north, California, and she's a real estate agent there. We've known each other for, for a little while. And so I'd like to introduce her, Shaniqua, let us know a little bit about yourself and then we'll go to everybody else. Hi, my name is Shaniqua Badger. I'm the team lead for the Badger Real Estate Group. We are a full service team out of Oakland, California. And um, I'm also a lab code agents moderator. So I'm really excited about being here today to, to kind of continue this conversation or even start this conversation, I should say. And I'm gonna pass it off to Ashley, you go first, and then Bishop, you go next, so we can have a formal introduction of everybody. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Ashley Thomas. I am uh, the broker of First Security Investment Company out of Los Angeles, California. Uh, I've been in the business for about 20 years. I also have the esteemed privilege and pleasure and honor to be able to serve as the National Third Vice President of NARAP, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Um, which is an advocacy group. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here and I look forward to the conversation and I'll pass it to Bishop. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Worsham on the West Coast. I sell real estate for Jesus. I'm just trying to get folks to relocate to heaven. But um, I love that. no, <laughs> I, um, I am a servant of the Lord. I am the pastor of a Adopting Church of Los Angeles. And uh, I also had the privilege of serving as a faith-based ambassador for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Um, uh, I am tasked with the responsibility of building a bridge between the faith and civic community with our real estate brokers and our national association as we promote the message and the importance of black home ownership, building black wealth through home ownership. I love that. Oh, well, thanks for being on. I appreciate all three of you on. Uh, this all stemmed from the current atmosphere in our country, and we wanted to address it just so that you can get this side of things so that those of you who don't fully understand what it is that, that they're going through and minorities in, in general are going through, I think this, this can really open up your eyes as to why real estate and the current atmosphere is, is really strongly related. So uh, with that, let's just get started. Um, Shaniqua, with what's happening, because you're in the West Coast, we're all in the West Coast here, but you're, you're in the Oakland-ish area, right? Mm -hmm. And with what's happening, what have you seen as, as something that's, that's really opened up your eyes over the last month as to as to where we're at as a country and how do you think that'll affect real estate, if at all? Well, what, what I can say is I think right now we're in a place, we've transitioned into a place where people are starting to have a collective voice. And it's, it's actually, um, it is actually interesting to see how diverse that collective voices has gotten over the past week. Uh, it's funny because when you look at in Oakland and you see the protests and they've been having protests consistently every day in the downtown core. And it's very interesting to see the diversity in the protests, the people who are open to listening, the people who are open to having a dialogue, the people who are demanding a change. And we can't do that unless we have a collective voice. Um, and that collective energy is absolutely powerful in being able to figure out how we can create reform, change, um, transition in, in, in the Black community, because honestly, we can't do it alone. Um, it's nice, you know, we, we've done it alone for many, 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 many generations, but, you know, we, we absolutely do need a collective voice, and I think that that's what we're seeing now. I agree. I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, it's, it's really awesome to see everybody come together. Well, a lot of people come together and really push for this change. Um, Ashley, in, in regards to, to what you've seen, what specifically do you think uh, 
is something that that we can do as real estate agents and just just human beings to be able to help in in the current atmosphere. I, I know Bishop Craig will have a lot to say on this. That's why I went to you first. Um, what do you think we can do as real estate agents and as human beings to be able to be uh, more involved and have something to to really say about this? Because I think it's an important, it's probably the most important issue we've seen in a very long time. You know, I, I think, um, you know, first I want to thank you for, you know, giving the platform for even the dialogue. I think that's just, just so important. Um, the first thing is, you know, in terms of we have to do what we're doing today is have an open and honest dialogue uh, about what's going on, what your experiences are, and we have to listen to each other. I feel that over the years we've moved into a culture where we have to be politically correct as opposed to being honest. And honesty takes, it's on two sides, right? So one, I have to be honest with how I feel and be able to tell you this is what I'm going through. And two, you have to be honest to listen and not be defensive. Um, a lot of times we, um, we talk about race, there's some defensiveness there. They're saying, hey, well, I'm not, I'm not racist. I'm, I feel like I'm being punished for my ancestors. I, I never did any of the bad things that happened to, to your people. Um, and so, uh, but however, the person that's communicating saying, I'm going through this, this is how I feel. Um, they're looking at how did I get here, right? So if you look at history, I'm, I'm a student of history. I love history because it gives us a, a tell about where we are. So if we look at history in American history, the black experience specifically, um, and you can extract that to other minority groups as well, but you say the black experience specifically, you say gone through 400 years of government sponsored um, you know, racism, government sponsored uh, inequities. Um, and now we say for 50 years, we've gone to be, to say, okay, those things are illegal. But what happened during that time? So you have one community building wealth during that time. You have another community trying to incur some income and trying to gra gravitate up. So I think as we have these dialogues, we have to be very honest. That's the first thing, whether it's real estate or not real estate, we have to be honest about how we feel and where we're at. I was actually, it's kind of funny, I was actually watching some shows um, that took place in the 80s, right? Old sitcoms. And the amount of honesty on these shows, they, there's no way that show could play today. Like, <laughs> I'm like, they said, what? You know, and you would think we've moved into a more progressive place in society, but we have, and we've actually gone backwards in terms of being able to speak our minds, being able to speak our opinions about its current situation without it being offended. Uh, can you give some examples of that specifically? Yeah, I, I will. Uh, one example, uh, old show, uh, Little House on the Prairie, right? So they had the young young black uh, actor on the show and I don't remember names. I was probably too young for it as well, but I, I was watching a clip and they said, okay, they were all in school and they said, what did you do? Um, what, write an essay about what you like. And so they wrote an essay and then they said, well, write an essay about what you don't like. And so they asked the young black boy what he did not like. And he says, being black in America, Right, and I thought that that was just such a deep comment that today they'd be like, no, nah, we can't put that on. You know, that's, that's too radical of a view. And I think, um, you know, we have to move beyond where we look at and say, uh, thank you, Todd Bridges, thank you. And we have, to, um, we have to move beyond equality and fairness being radical ideas. And that's where I think we are today. Those things, when we talk about them, when we bring them up, it's like, that's radical. You know, we can't talk, that's too much. You know, let's, let's scale it back. So um, those, that's just one show, but there's a lot of shows that you can go back and look at and say, that show would never air today. All right, that, that makes sense. So Bishop Craig, you're, you're more on the side of, well, not real estate, but you're helping, you're helping people uh, cope with the situation and, and really because you're right in the middle of everything right? You're seeing how this affects people's lives deeper, I think, than, than most people, because you get to see uh, on both sides, business-wise, their life, right, spiritually. Um, what are some ways that you're seeing those people that can help, 
right? Specifically here, the real estate community. What are some things that we can do today, this week, uh, just steps that we can take to help, right? Because some people genuinely want to help. They just don't know what route to take. Yeah, I think that uh, the beauty in this is that, unfortunately, um, what we have witnessed through the death of George Floyd, I believe Floyd became the sacrificial lamb to awaken on a radical scale the social consciousness of people. Blacks, browns, and whites have come together and this is a battle cry. And it's a battle cry to move beyond accepting a Band-Aid. I mean, how many times have we been in this place in America and we slap a Band-Aid on it and we move on with our lives and 120 days from now, somebody else will be lynched on the public streets of America, right? Yep. And so it's a battle cry now to move from a band-aid to attack systems. And when you talk about systemic racism and systemic oppression, I want us to be clear we're going against systems. Now we've had this conversation 400, 500 years of slavery. Slavery ended, yes, to a certain degree, and I'll qualify that statement in a moment. Slavery ended to a certain degree, but the plantation is still in operation. White House, State House, City Halls have become the modern day plantation. So we end slavery, which let's be very clear, uh, since this moment, I really had to go back and look at the work of the Reverend Nat Turner, who, who, who led a revolt against slavery. It, it, blood was shed. Unfortunately, he lost his life in the process. Then you have that, the work of the abolitionists Frederick Douglass, who came to fight against slavery, and then, of course, Harriet Tubman, interrupted the economy of the oppressor, right? So it's always been drastic measures. So we go through all of those years, slavery has ended, but then we took on a new form of slavery that the plantation allowed, the state house, the White House, and our local city halls, and we called it segregation. We get through Jim Crow. And we're still fighting through the 21st century model of slavery, slavery, which is discrimination, which I believe falls within the context of real estate and why many minorities have a challenge in attaining and acquiring real estate. So this is a battle cry to fight aggressively against systems. All right. So. Bishop Craig, I want to go a little deeper into, into that. The systems that you're talking about, what do those look like um, specifically? And, and what are some things that we should be pushing to, to change with those systems? Can you give some examples? So systematic, when, when you talk about systemic racism, it births systemic inequality. Oh, God. And systemic inequality is wrapped up in policy, all right? So racism that operates out of the plantation to create policy that further restricts and oppresses people of color or the minority, if you will. So at the end of the day, this is all wrapped up against policy. So my stance as a pastor I, I, I spent the day Tuesday in the streets with the protesters. The clergy protested. I went out and joined another one with Black Lives Matter, just a multiplicity of groups. And I just wanted to go out there and listen because I really, it, I can't sit on this line today and speak to this stuff if I'm not out there. I need to hear right. and understand that the context of this is totally different from the 1992 Rodney King riot, yep. right? So I have to listen. And one of the things that I share with the protesters is, listen, you know, I get your anger, you know, but jumping on the mayor's car is not going to fix anything. Cussing out the district attorney, calling her out of her name and all of these things is not going to change anything, right? What You're not fighting against a person. You're 
fighting against systems. The person was only elected and or hired and or appointed to manage systems that the person that appointed them already inherited. So let's redirect the focus. Attack the system. So real estate brokers, preachers, NAACP, Herbaly, all these groups need to come together and start having intellectual dialogue and conversation about how we're going to attack systems. So my word has always been, first of all, in order to attack a system, you got to read. Can't be out there on the streets protesting if you're not reading and, and learning and understanding what are the systems that we need uh, to attack. So in order to go against these systems of inequality, we've got to read, we've got to study, we've got to have conversations like this, we've got to, we've got to have a scribe writing these things down, then we can start talking about legislation. All right. I love that. Shaniqua, why do you think it's so hard for people to have these conversations back and forth um, in, in either in public forums or just in real life? Why, why is it so difficult? Well, I think that that is um, just part of our culture. And, and I mean, a, a culture as a society, there's this cancel culture that is rampant these days. And so people are kind of walking a very fine line in publicly about what they're willing to say and what they're what they're not willing to say. And honestly, it's it's sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And we have to we have to figure out what that balance is. But at the same time, you know, your your perspective of what you think is bad is not necessarily the next person's perspective of what they think is good. And so we have to continue to have dialogue and listen with understanding. Or otherwise, this just doesn't work. Um, but we do have to create um, spaces where we can have conversations. I think when I look at how I manage my personal Facebook group, I mean, page, Facebook page, um, in, in my social media pages, like sometimes you see me in the comments managing the, the, the conversations so that they don't get too aggressive. <laughs> I want to be able to have conversations. But listen, you're not going to beat anybody up on my thread. Um, yeah. uh, so, you know, people need to be able to have a space where they, they can have a conversation. And I think sometimes we forgot to, to we've, we've gotten away from that. And, and quite honestly, you know, I have to remind people that during the civil rights movement, at some point, we had to have a conversation with the people that, that sat on the other side of the table that created these systemic policies. We couldn't just protests, we had to break down and have a conversation with people. And that's where the real work started and ended. So, you know, we have to get back to that at some point. And unfortunately, I think that there's a whole generation that wasn't taught how to do that. We did that out of necessity, because that was the only option that we had. And we exercised the amount of time that we needed to do it. We didn't care if it took 10 years, we didn't care if it took 15 years. It was part of the strategy and we and people dedicated and committed that time to make that that strategy was able to be put in place and, and, and executed until they got the outcome that they wanted. So we need to get back to that. We need to start um, reaching into other generations and teaching them how to do that. I've been um, a part of advocacy for humans since I was 16. I was a, a Silicon Valley um, youth president for the NAACP starting at 16. So I've been doing this for a very long time. I'm 43, I'm gonna be turning 44 this year. So, you know, we, we really do need to teach people how to do this. We do this, especially when we're looking at the real estate community. We do this with our clients. We need to learn how to do this in our households. Yeah, I think that's the key. People don't, going back to, to, to Bishop Craig, I think people just don't, they don't know where to go to, to, to start opening up a conversation and having this conversation, whether it's online, in person, or they don't know how to, pro believe it or not, they don't know how to protest. They don't know what it is that they need to do to get involved to make a change. So I'm going to go to Ashley. Ashley, yes. um, what are some things, because you're not far from Bishop Craig, right? You're not too far. No. Um, this was. 
And what are some things that you've seen in the Los Angeles area that, that are very clear to you that show the inequalities of, of our current world that, that we're in with real, in regards to real estate specifically? Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. Um, my family was from Louisiana. And a lot of my family in the, in the South, they look at California as this great melting pot, per se, this, this land of, of great equality and, and no injustice. And um, I have to remind them that, um, you know, the institutional racism ex- exists even here. You know, in terms of redlining, the results from redlining still exist today, right? I mean, we're all, for the most of us, you know, that are on this call today or whatnot are in real estate. You understand the neighborhood demographics. Like, how did the demographics even get there? We're still in 2020, and those are the demographics of it. Now, from a license perspective, like, we cannot talk about that. But the reality of it is, is it is what it is, right? That is uh, the breakdown of that particular neighborhood. And so I think if we, if I just take a one step back, I think it's very important to understand that any group of people is not a monolithic group, right? It's not a group like the black community. We are broken down and Bishop and I and Shanique and I have massive debates from different perspectives. We don't have the same political views. We don't necessarily have the same views on education and those, those things. But America treats the group as a monolithic group. You know, I think it was very telling when you have the president of the United States say, stand up and say, the blacks like me. Well, you know, maybe some do and maybe some don't, but you can't put everybody in the same pot. And, and in order for us to grow to where we ultimately want to go, we have to understand that there are unique differences in, in, in the group itself. You know, there are black Republicans, there are black Democrats, there are independents, and there are blacks that will not participate in elections, period, right? And I think that that's the same for every group. So I think in Los Angeles specifically that you're you're saying, you know, I think that um, what I've been inspired by the last 12, 13 days has truly been in the uprising of people. Uh, Bishop spoke a lot about protesting and the effectiveness of protesting. What I found, and it even has changed some of my own views on protesting, what I have found is, is sometimes you can only knock on the door and ask to come in for so long, and then there has to be a disruption. And that if you only hear me when I disrupt, then you've trained me to be a constant disruptor, right? Like if I tell my daughter, go to bed at nine o'clock, she doesn't go to bed, she hangs out and doesn't go to bed, right? Then I say, I'm going to take this from you unless you go to bed. And now she goes to bed. Now in her mind, she says, the, in order for me to keep these things that I love, I have to go to bed, right? And so the same thing is happening here. This is not the first time we have had conversations about police brutality in the, in the community. This is not the first time we've had conversations about inequalities in housing, right? But now all of a sudden, when... 3,000 people show up in front of City Hall. Now we want to pass legislation. Why is that? You know, why could we not been heard when we wanted to set up the meeting with the mayor or we wanted to set up the meeting with city council and those things got pushed to the side because they weren't important, right? And now the actions of the people is causing the changes. So I'm inspired by it. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm glad to see it going on. I don't support looting. I don't support the violence. I don't support any of that. But I think that the, the fact that people come together um, and all people of all different races, cultures, creeds are coming together to support an initiative is so very inspiring and it's important. All right. I love that. And I, if I could add to that, uh, I, I read something. Uh, I saw this on Fox News and uh, to Ashley's point, um, it seems to me that the civil rights movement has come alive again. Now, when we talk about actual change, Fox News reported today that there was a there was the the change rate within seven days of the incident after MLK was assassinated. Two point nine percent of change took place within seven days of his assassination. 
the Rodney King case acquittal 1.2 percent wow. change during the 1992 civil unrest and the George Floyd death mm-hmm. 3.4 percent wow within seven days and, and I just want you to think about this even here locally the battle cry has been defund the police reallocate the dollars into communities of color on Tuesday, thousands, I'm talking from, from as far as Hollywood, it seemed like pockets of protesters at one time converged on the steps of the LAPD headquarters and then moved to the Hall of Justice and then moved to City Hall within the span of 60 minutes. Thousands, I've witnessed it with my own eyes, them coming from every direction, organized, calculated and strategic on Tuesday on Wednesday the announcement was made that there would be upwards of a 2.5 million dollar reallocation uh, within the excuse me actually it was more than that it was 150 was it somewhere around 150 to 250 million dollars excuse me that would be reallocated from LAPD into programs within communities of color. Wow. So the, the organization of the people and their voices are being heard and seen. It, it's sparking all over the country, change, change it. And so I just believe we've got to take those individuals that are protesting. Uh, perhaps we need to look at organizing a nationwide think tank. Because once the protesting settles down, we still have work to do. I agree. Well, once again, we'll be back in this same position in less than 90 days. I agree with you. So then I have a question on that, two questions on that. One is uh, for those people saying that, well, you know what, you're, you're taking a side, not you personally, but in general, you're taking a side and this is political. Um, what do you have to say to that? Any of you can answer this one. Is this something that's political or is this not? I'm, I'm going to say it is. I mean, it, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't change unless we go after the, the policies that support the systemic racism. So if we have to if we have to infiltrate the pop, the, the the political bodies that create the policy, then it, it is absolutely political. All right. Only because I know some people say it isn't, but I don't think they comprehend how deep this goes with what Bishop Craig was saying at the beginning uh, with with the systems, right? That's, it's definitely political, even though we don't want to get into it, right? This, I think, from what I see, from what I know, it's definitely political, right? And we need to make some changes. And I think that's where we, uh, as a collective community and group of people, we can then say, look, this is what we stand for. And let's put in leaders in place that can make these changes to the systems that have been in place that are antiquated. Right. Um, but what yeah, other I, things I, can I, we do? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I don't, I think that the, it, it's, it, it stems all the way back from if, if you want to pull back a whole bunch of layers, you can go ahead and do that because how, how much time do you have? But <laughs> If you go and look seriously, if you go and look back at the the system of slavery, right? That was a capitalistic uh, entity that really built the economy of this country. Now, from slavery, it transitioned into the passing of the Thirteenth Amendment, which then transitioned the ability to uh, 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 systematize from a government perspective the incarceration of people, right? And then th- then that's a whole nother group of working class people that they can, you know, do whatever they want in the system. Um, it, and you go and, and look at all the other tricks around housing, um, health, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. And, and I look at it from, when I look at it from a real estate perspective, I really do think that, and I said this before, that people are operating in a, in a silo. You have a collective, there's a collective voice that is 
required to have a a a, a position to effect change in not only in our industry but in underserved and disenfranchised communities, specifically the black community. And I'm here to let everybody know, I'm gonna have a very frank conversation with you all, that when black people create movements, it opens the door for everybody. Um, and if you, if you don't believe me, just look at the history of NARAB and understand that. Because at one time, NARAB, NAR did not allow blacks and, and women into their organization until NARAB advocated to do so. So you have to understand how all of this triggers one thing after another, and you have to figure out how you can be part of the voice and part of the change to affect to that change that that creates a, a better society for your children and your grandchildren and some of the people that you haven't even met to be able to live in. So we have a, a role in this and a piece in this. Yeah, I would just add to that. I. I agree it's political 100%. Um, our responsibilities as citizens of this great country is not only to vote, but it's to hold those in which we voted for accountable. I'm not tied to you because I voted for you and I supported you. I'm gonna hold you accountable and then I might be the one that leads the movement to remove you because you pandered and I believed in your pandering to put you in office. I believe you were a part of the community and you weren't. And so I think what we have to do a better job of is calling um, our elected officials to the carpet um, after they've been voted in office because we vote based on a belief. And, and we talk about systems, uh, running for office is a system, right? You, you understand how to do it. You understand kiss this baby, do this, say this to these people, go visit this church on this Sunday. And you, you understand the system, right? It's a system. So now when you have the job, you've been hired. Now it's up to us as the citizens to be your employer and to remove you in the in your failure to perform, right? And so what we have is we have a system, a political system that um, looks for the next election and allows you to stay stagnant in your position without any accountability. And that's, I believe, what has to change because when we talk about policy, uh, policy has to be intentional. If you say you support something, then you have to be intentional about the support behind it, not support me from a distance, right? I need you on the front line at Mr. Policy or Mrs. Policymaker making those changes. So um, I choose not to wait until the next election um, to voice my concerns because, you know, that's too long. You know, generations are going by in between elections uh, with no assistance. So uh, I just want to add to the political part because there's far too much pandering going on and we have to hold people accountable. Yeah, I agree. Bishop Craig, you mentioned that if we don't, if we don't start doing something now and create more momentum, this is going to die out in 90 days, right? Um, what are, what are some suggestions from you as to things that we can do now to continually push this forward? Because I agree with you. I think this is awesome. I think this is an amazing moment in life. But if we don't push it forward into, into a place where there's no coming back and we see real change, it's going to require a lot more of what we're doing uh, consistency and for a longer time. So first we must, those of us that are sharing in this moment and, and others that we know that want to be on the battlefield for justice, first of all, we must, you know, we, the two words I've been using in every form I've been in, accountability and responsibility and we want to hold electeds accountable but we have to hold ourselves responsible okay now first of all i must rebuke myself and i'm speaking personally because those of us that have relationships with these elected officials we have to you know you cannot have that type of access and favor and when you all come together you're having these kumbaya moments no, those days are over. You know, if, if I have a relationship with my district attorney and my mayor and my council person, I'm to the point where I can call you on the cell phone and discuss the various things, then I'm going to take full advantage of that relationship from this point forward, and we're going to have some very tough, serious conversations. Kumbaya days are over. So that's first and foremost. Anybody watching that has a relationship with your council person, or, or any type of elected policymaker, 
it's time to use that access and call them to the carpet and every person that is in your life or that is in the community that you deal with, I'm texting people now, hey, listen, if, if, if there are specific things you want to see, I need you to email me, text me a pointed list of things you'd like to see. So when I sit down with these people and have these conversations, I can say, hey, this is what's coming from the community. And I need to know what are you willing to do? Or, as Ashley said, I think we're going to take this revolt, if you will, to the next level. We I think we need to get together, and, I, and I'm very serious when I say this, we need to get together and start unseating every person, whether they're black, white, or brown, that has oppressed this community, because you, you can oppress your own people. You can oppress your own people. Now, that's a whole nother uh, uh, conversation that I'm not even going to want to let, let Ashley get into that, but we will <laughs> elect, unelect <laughs> unseat those that have oppressed their own community. Well, that Bishop come, Craig, come into our, yeah. with that, just I wanted to add, and you can continue, I think we can oppress our own people by not doing anything, right? That's, that's something that's just like, well, people that say, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna doing anything, right? That's, I mean, <laughs> that's almost the biggest form of oppression. Mm -hmm. Right. Your silence. I, I want to just I want to add to that, Bishop, really, really quick. I, you know, I earlier I talked about uh, in in Los Angeles specifically. If we go back a few years ago, there was an ownership change with the Los Angeles Clippers, right? There was some things that happened, and um, you had a a great debate come out, and the debate was about freedom of speech, right? And it says. We have the freedom of speech and we feel that we don't. I, I, a lot of people in the community were looking at the players to say, I refuse to play, right? But I, I've changed my opinion on this. I think the, the, the people in the position need the support of the people in the masses, right? So if there would have been a protest that said, we're, not, we're canceling this game today, right? The, the players would have felt support it to be able to go out and do some more. If you're looking at what's going on around the country today, because the people are showing up, then a lot of the influencers are able to take their veil off, to not have to pay, play corporate games or, or whatnot, and are able to get out there and join with the people because they need the support. So it's really indicative on the citizen, the, the average Joe, to stand up and speak up because when he or she does that, then the influencers can feel at freedom, can feel at, at liberty to go out there and fight alongside. That's true, Ashley. I think, and to add on top of that, I think that well, this is one of the reasons that Shaniqua and I are doing this is that, I don't know which one of you said this, but there are pockets out there that just don't experience, um, that don't experience this, right? What we, what we live on, on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And, and just because it's not happening in your area doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? And I think that's a big challenge to bring it to somebody like that and say, hey, this is, this is the reality for millions of people, right? And we need your help right now to focus so that we can change this. And even though it's not affecting you, it's real, right? How do we how do we demonstrate this to people that just that are kind of like one step away from from reality because it just doesn't touch them? How do we how do we? I'm going to go to Bishop Craig on that. Bishop Craig, how do we do that? I I, I really don't know if I have an answer from that for that. Um, I think we talked and we talked and we talked. We dialogued. We, you know, I um, told someone last week. You know, I, actually, I told the mayor of our city, I'm town hauled out. I'm dialogued out. I'm, I'm just tired of talking because this is all we do is talk. Yeah, and we leave from this space, right? Um, I really think 
that we go back to the old original model of thinking, right? Bringing thinkers together that will effectuate the change we need. Thinkers. Now, when I think about that, I look at breaking that down, if you will, into quadrants. You've got real estate, right? Education, uh, housing. There's so many quadrants of that, that that can be developed of thinkers. We need that synergy. I don't think we have that synergy. I think you're right. Do you think it has to do because there's no one leader that is representing right now? Or Yeah, those days are over. You see, and I'm, you know, I, I, I was guilty of thinking that way. Oh, yeah. I wish so-and-so would step up. Mm -hmm. And then I had to think the days of having one spokesperson for, for, for all of us, mm -hmm. it, it's long gone. There is an army of leaders Got it. that are going to be raised up. Now, what if you had an army of leaders in housing, which encompasses real estate, an army of leaders in education, an army of leaders, you know, in, just in every aspect right that affects our people that's powerful and those leaders are thinkers and what if you were able to what if you were able to take those protesters in the street that have passion for social justice because everybody marching doesn't have a passion they're just supporting the movement but there are marchers and protesters that have a passion for social justice and for policy get into the street, find them, put them at a table and teach them. See, this is where me, this is where my head is now. Teach them how to articulate a pointed agenda to elected officials. Because uh, the fact is the elected officials can be passive. So once I cuss you out, you've, all, you've shut every, any possibility has been shut down. And I can do that as an elected official because I have the power I, I have the power to ignore you and walk away. Yeah. Once, once you have, in my mind, disrespected me. But now, if, 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 if I'm a DA or a prosecutor and Ashley comes to my office and Shaniqua comes to my office with a pointed agenda and, are, and holds me accountable and, and presents to me a pointed agenda of, dem uh, of demands, very pointed, and articulate those things to me, and then you threaten me too. Because your articulation and, and organization is going to show me you really have the power and ability to mobilize and unseat me. I have no choice but to get my act together. Got it. And see, this is what you're saying right now. How ironic that all of a sudden, everybody wants to work for us on the brink of so many municipal elections across the country. How ironic. Yeah, that's very true. Very good point, because I think what you said is really the way that we can have this last, uh, more of a lasting effect than just dying down in 90 days. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this too, recognizing um, I think leaders have to recognize when their time is up. See, you, you, you've been on the forefront for so long speaking on behalf of the people. You're out of touch. You don't know the pulse. You can't know the pulse sitting up on the, on the 32nd floor of a building. <laughs> you know, you, you, you don't know the pulse. And then you, you bring people that are polished and look good around you know, um, that fit your image, but they don't know the post. I got to be willing as a leader to realize perhaps my time is up and maybe my time is to move from the camera to behind the scenes to culture should equal badge and say, hey, your time is now. You need to be one of the voices and I'm going to push you from behind. I'm going to help you. So we have people that are still trying to hold the seat but maybe they need to step aside and let the relevant voices that are in the trenches start speaking on behalf of the people. 
I love that. That's a really good point. Uh, now, this is this goes out to everybody because we're almost up on our hour. So, Shaniqua, Ashley, Bishop Craig, is there anything that you wanted me to touch on that you wanted to bring up that that I missed? Besides everything, just I mean, let's let's be focused because we could go on for hours here. Um, what's something important that I missed that you wanted to touch on? Well, if I could um, briefly bring this up, I think this has been very powerful, and I, and I really appreciate lab code agents opening up this dialogue. And this is why I love the culture of lab code agents so much. I just sing the praise of, uh, praises of LCA as much as I possibly can because of this culture. And I've, I've talked to you about this before, Tristan, um, and Nick as well. Nick is not present, but you know th this is part of the culture of LCA. Um, it is a community uh, that is dedicated to the improvement of people. And I really appreciate that. And, and really what we need to start seeing specifically in our own industry is more platforms like this, having frank conversations with the people who need to be representing those conversations. Is because I can tell you in the past that I have seen or, or, or gone to conferences, and I'm not gonna mention any names, but I've seen gone to conferences where we've had a conversation about race and real estate, and there are two white women representing that conversation. And I can, and, and very quickly, I it shot out an email and it was kind of a WTF email because that was a, a space that didn't need to be occupied by those two gentlemen. So we really do need to have more people coming forward that operate huge platforms in our industry that continue to have this conversation of how we can get closer to improvement to removing the disparities that affect the black community, um, uh, specifically around housing, because we can control that conversation very easily. I mean, we can be a part of that movement very easy because we, we do some of the most intimate things is we create homes for people. Yeah. Um, so we can absolutely be a part of that and be uh, a put ourselves in a position of transformation and change. Shaniqua, I'd like to talk about redlining next time we do this, just so that people understand that even though it was it was done with in 1977, it's still around. So I'd love to I'd love to talk about that um, on our next one. Uh, Ashley, anything you want to add? Yeah, I want to just uh, just put out there in terms of legacy. I think real estate and legacy go hand in hand. Um, many of us are in this business and we plan on handing down our book of business or our business or our properties or in some form as a legacy in terms of forward thinking. Um, but I think we would be remiss if we did not touch on the legacy that got us here, right? So if we look at, um, and these are some stats out of the U.S. Census Bureau for 2018. If you look at income, income is wages. That's what that's how it's a flow of resources into the household. So we look at income. So we say in America for every $1 that flows into a white household, 59 cents flows into a black household and 72 cents flows into a Latino household. So, you know, that's, that's wages, right? And so the, the spread there is, you know, is sizable. And so when we look at real estate, putting a property on the market, having buyers be able to compete, um, there already is a, a race that started well ahead. When you look at wealth, now wealth is different because wealth is not a flow of income that comes in. Wealth is where your savings, it's your assets, it's what you put to the side, right? We all, we all know what wealth is. So for every $1 of wealth that a white household has, a black household has 10 cents. And so you say, well, what happened? You know, the income disparity is, is great, it's large, but the wealth disparity is ridiculous, it's off the charts. And why did that happen? And I, I believe as America, we refuse to look at the legacy that got us to the wealth gap here today. We, I love Monopoly. My wife won't, she refuses to play Monopoly with me. <laughs> It gets out of control, right? I have people that are just on my list that refuse to play with me, but I love it. I'm aggressive at, at Monopoly, right? I get in trouble. But Monopoly, if we look at the leg legacy of where we are today, right? We say for 400 terms around the board, you know, whites were able to amass wealth while blacks had to sit on go, right? And then for the last 50 terms, 50 years, we say, okay, 
let's make it fair. Everybody gets one roll of the dice. We all will take turns and we'll rotate it. There's no way you can catch up to that wealth gap of 400 years, right? And so I think that we have to be intentional on our policy to address that. Um, it's not good enough to say, okay, well, we are here today. That was a thing in the past. We had Barack Obama. He was a black president. Everything's good, right? Kumbaya. And it's not kumbaya because education is still behind. I live in Baldwin Hills and in Lamert Park. Um, you have homes that are being sold for six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. But the school system is still rated two out of 10. Why does that happen? Because what's supposed to be synonymous with real estate is that wherever the, the school system is, the houses tend to drive up because everybody wants to put their children in the greatest school system. That's supposed to be synonymous. So in the black neighborhood where the housing prices are up, why is the education system so low? And that's happening because we're going through changes and different things like that. But it's, it's the only community that I know of that this happens in. And so we have to ask that question. And then not just to wrap it up, I say, and I tell people all the time, you know, when I go to uh, home improvement stores or whatnot, I mean, the price is the same. They don't, they don't charge me more for cement, more for wood, depending on where I'm going to utilize these, these tools, right? And so when you look at, right, it's a true statement. So wherever I go, if I'm going to build a house and I'm going to go buy the whole house from the lumber store, then I'm going to pay the exact same amount. But wherever that house is at, the difference in, in, in that price is so huge. Trillions of dollars are being bled out of the black community because of appraisal differences, because this house in this particular neighborhood is going to be devalued because of the people that live there. It makes no sense. And so for America to really be intentional about wanting to make the change, we have to be intentional about change. And that has to change. I love that. Bishop, Craig, any closing words here? Uh, great, great conversation. Hope we can continue it. And I, uh, I think that you have a great platform and hopefully we can look at creating a pool of, of thinkers. You know what? I'd love to do that. I'd love to really create a, what you called, Bishop Craig, really like a, a think tank or leaders that can come together and, and really think of how we can actually make real change last. And, and we can do that easily in this, in this community. So yeah, I'm definitely up for, for actually creating that. So we can do that. Shaniqua, let's, let's really talk on that and really uh, grow on that part. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you so much for being on, I appreciate it. I think this is like step one of a million Let's uh, let's keep on doing this. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tristan. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.